So uh, solving the growth puzzle, it's a very grand title. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk uh, in the next 30 minutes a bit about kind of growth or sort of what, how some of my research relates to aspects of growth. And I'm going to try and convince you that when we think about growth, um, we often think about you know, austerity programs or we think about innovation. I'm going to try and convince you that these kind of people are quite important for growth. So you might know this is... This is uh, this is a fictional manager of the American version of The Office, Michael Scott, who is the, uh, he's his world's best boss here, he's actually the world's worst boss. Uh, so I'm going to argue in this, when we think about growth and productivity, we should actually be thinking a lot about managers and managements. And I'm going to tell you about why, why I think that as, as we go through and what it means for, for government policy. So it's very easy to motivate this. We care about growth a lot. The world's uh, you know, Ireland, Britain, um, the rest of the developed world are still suffering from a serious hangover from the global financial crisis. Uh, in the EU, uh, growth is particularly weak, and the question is, what is to be done about it? Um, I mean, broadly, the, the, in, my, you know, in my view, I think there has to be a combination of, of three things, the three pillars that both Mario Draghi and uh, Abe have talked about, which is a combination of monetary policy, fiscal policy, uh, but also, and this is the focus today, structural reforms. I'm going to, I'm going to really talk most about those, those today. Um, so there's four parts to this I'm going to talk about. First of all, is the economic challenge that we face. Then I'm going to talk a bit about the research we've been doing over measuring management, then talk about the relationship with the performance, and finally come back to what this means for policy and the drivers of growth. So just to give you some sense about um, the, the differences and the challenges we face. So this is a comparison between the uh, 15, uh, 15 largest countries in the EU and uh, the United States from 2014. So um, Europe has about, on the measure of GDP per capita, something like 30% uh, lower uh, income than, uh, than the United States. That's quite a big gap to, to think about. Now, when people see these numbers then you know, one, one view as well, this is just because uh, unemployment is a lot worse in Europe than it is in the United States. So if you correct that and look at a measure of productivity, which is GDP per worker, uh, then we still see a very, uh, a very significant gap, so something like 22%. Um, so it bridges some of the gap, maybe 8 percentage points, but certainly not all of it. Uh, the other story is, of course, that well, maybe it's all, all to do with uh, taking longer holidays, and, in fact, that's not the case. So if you correct for hours, you still see there's a very significant gap still remaining. So most of the gap isn't uh, simply due to the labour market, hours and jobs. It's also to do with the fact that those workers are less productive when they are in, in those jobs. So this problem, um, you know, you, you might think, well, this is only a, you know, a reflection of the financial crisis. But, in fact, this actually preceded the financial crisis. So if we look at productivity, output per hour worked, um, over a period since 1980, comparing, say, the EU and the US, you can see that for a long period of time, this is the levels, the, um, the US was more productive than Europe, but Europe was catching up. So Europe is the, the red line there. And you can see, and this has been true since the Second World War, there was this gradual convergence um, until in the mid-90s, you know, Europe had almost got as productive as the United States was. Now, from the mid-90s onwards, the gap started to go in the opposite direction. There was divergence between the European Union and the US, even prior to the financial crisis. So this, is a, this has been exasperated by what's happened in the last few years, but it actually preceded what had happened before. So again, just to give you a sense about the, the impact of the crisis, so this takes the, the 10 years before the crisis versus the kind of seven years after the crisis until last year. So here's the kind of US, so productivity growth, GDP per worker growth, was growing at about two percentage points per year prior to the crisis. And then after the crisis in the US, has been a slowdown, something like 1.5%. If we compare that with Europe, you, this is what I showed you in the previous graph. Europe has already had slower productivity growth before the crisis. But then after the crisis, I mean, there's, there's been a, you know, this disaster where our productivity growth has fallen to about half a percentage point a year. Of course, that's even worse in some countries than, than other countries. So that's the, you know, that shows you this, the, the crisis has exasperated a problem which was, was already there before the crisis. Interesting, Japan is the third comparison. So Japan was actually doing worse than Europe pre-crisis in terms of productivity growth. And during the crisis, after the crisis, or during the crisis, it's done slightly, 
slightly better, but still there's been a slowdown. So although all countries have been affected by the crisis, um, it's happened to a greater extent in, in some, some parts of the world, particularly Europe than others. Okay, so that's the kind of macro, the big, the big picture. Now, you know, it's useful to look at you know, the big picture. This is where Dan has come from. But I, what I like to go is to go underneath that, to kind of look at the firms and, and uh, plants and stores under, underlying those n numbers. So the interesting thing is that you know, there's these big differences across countries. You see also huge differences in productivity between firms within countries. So in a typical you know, narrow industry, say take US concrete, but this is an average, and you can look at any, any industry. If you compare the plants at the top 10% versus the bottom 10%, labor productivity output per worker is something like four times higher in a typical industry in the top 10% to the bottom 10% of plants. And you know, of course you might say that's all due to different capital, different types of workers. If you control for all of those things, and some economists have this, 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 this ugly name, total factor productivity, which basically means efficiency. And when you take all the inputs and look at the outputs, how much of the difference of output is simply due to the way you use those inputs. So that TFP difference is still absolutely enormous, a kind of two to one difference. Even in a single industry, um, in a country like the US where things are very competitive, if you look at other countries, those gaps are even bigger. So very large amounts of variation and heterogeneity within industries. And these are kind of persistent. And as I said, they're even bigger in the European Union and developing countries. So if you think about those macro trends I described before, those increases of productivity, um, it's not true to, to have this kind of view that somehow you know, every firm is kind of getting more productive. A lot of this productivity increase is coming from what, you know, Schumpeter, dead, dead Austrian economist, called a creative destruction, which is the phenomena by which more productive firms kind of grow and less productive firms shrink and exit. So at least half of the overall productivity growth we see is due to that churning, that kind of creative destruction. Um, and that makes you immediately think, well, understanding you know, why firms' productivity is so different is a really important part of thinking about these macroeconomic productivity differences. So are there reasons for these differences? Well, you know, as I said, technology matters a lot, um, but it's not the, anything like the whole story because you can control for any measure of technology under the sun that you want to, you know, measures of uh, search and development or patents, these type of things. You still end up with a very large unexplained residual. And furthermore, if you look at the impact of new technologies, so I've done some work with uh, colleagues at Harvard and Stanford looking at the impact of, say, new computers, new information communication technologies, the impact that they have on firms' productivity depends fundamentally on the management and organisation in place. You can spend huge amounts of money on computers, and they can actually do nothing for your profits or productivity. In fact, they can reduce them sometimes. Um, so thinking about management actually may be, may, be, may be as important or more important. And certainly, you know, business case studies, the history of, history of economic thought has placed these... Uh, you know, as an important thing, but until recently it's been impossible to really gauge that in any kind of systematic way. So what I'm going to try and do now is convince you we have some way of actually shedding some light on this, this kind of issue in a kind of quantifiable way. So how on earth do you quantify management? Isn't this impossible? Well, so Nick and I, Nick Bloom and I, for the last 10 years or so, have been trying to uh, make some progress on this, working with many other people. So there's three kind of steps. I won't bore you too much with the methodology of this, but there's basically three steps to try to measure management. So one is trying to think about different practices which may be important for improving productivity. Um, so we um, worked with lots of people in, in uh, industry and in consultants and coming up with 18 of these. So for, none of this is rocket science. This is all about how you do what you do more efficiently. So things like how you set sensible targets. You set things which are stretching, but are impossible to reach. Do you have a mixture of financial and non-financial targets? Uh, things about monitoring, so how you collect and use data, how you do lean manufacturing type of techniques. And people, how do you, how do you reward people? How do you promote people? Do you promote based on effort and ability, or are you basically just promoting people who are connected, who are based on tenure rather than their actual, their actual effort and ability? So I'll give you a couple of examples of that in a second, but none of them are kind of particularly uh, complicated things. So we have a set of questions. We then have we then interview firms. So we have a basically uh, usually a, between about a forty-five minute interview of um, of plant managers, uh, manufacturing plant managers in the middle of the organisation. CEOs are great to talk to, but they often don't know what's going on in their firm. 
Um, so it's good. We, we target the people in the middle. Okay, so we have these set of questions. Then the question is, well, how do we get the truth out of people? Don't people just you know, lie to us when we interview them? So we have a bunch of tricks that we try and do. We call this the double-blind technique. So the interviewers doing the interviews don't know anything about the performance of the company. And on the other side, the managers who we interview are not told they're being scored. So we're going to score these managers across all these 18 questions. Um, uh, from you know, a low score to a high score, from one to five, they don't know that they're being scored. And the reason that we keep that blind on their side is because of the well-known psychological bias that if I'm interviewing somebody, they're going to say what they think I want to hear. So we, they, have, they think they're having an open-ended conversation. Typically, these were students, often you know, MBA students from all over the world. In the meantime, these people have been trained to score them rigorously across these different... Uh, uh, I, we can talk about going to the ethics of this later. It passed the Stanford's <laughs> Ethics Committee under the category of what's called necessary deception. <laughs> Finally, uh, why does anybody participate in these interviews? We've interviewed now about 15,000 firms in 34 countries. Why does anybody participate? Well, we have very tricks to get people to participate. So uh, we introduce as a lean manufacturing interview. We get financial information from company accounts and Mr. data. We get official endorsements from respected institutions like uh, the Bundesbank, uh, Bank of England, uh, the Federal Reserve, and so on. Different things work in different countries. So in Germany, we send the German managers before we interview them an email which has the double-headed cre Prussian crest of the eagle. And the Germans are very respectful of authority, as many of you know, so the managers respond well to that and answer our surveys. In America, we had a letter from the Federal Reserve, and we had things like liberal communists shouted us down the phone. We found that Americans respond very badly to anything which smacks of the government, but they respond much better to the fact these were run by MBA students doing this stuff. So it's horses for courses. Um, but the bottom line is we get about a 45% response rate, which is very high for a voluntary survey. Because we know the non-responders as well as the responders, we can show that there's, it's not as if it's the more productive or better profitable firms are responding. It looks very balanced on the characteristics. OK, these are the kind of questions we have. So one question is yeah, how you track performance in your firm. So a low score here would be companies who are not tracking anything or the things they're tracking are unrelated to their business objectives. A high score would be firms who are actually tracking what goes on frequently and communicating that to the staff. There's no good collecting information on output or inventories or how people are doing if it's locked away in your office drawer. So the important thing is actually communicating this. So the managers we're interviewing don't see this. We, we'd have an open-ended conversation with them. I'd, be, I'd, I'd say things to them. I'd say, well, Dan, tell me about some of the information you collect here. And he would talk to me, and from that answer... That would be how I would, I would score him. And so we've done things like sending in students into these factories afterwards with clipboards to see what happens and a variety of things. This type of open-ended questioning seems to quite well. Some, somewhere between a kind of case study approach and a more standard type of survey-based approach, which economists are used to. So as I said, we now have in the world... So all this data is fully, freely available. You can download it from the website. People are using it all over the world and, and teaching and other, other places. We have it in five major waves. We cover 34 countries, including the Republic of Ireland. It's about 15,000 firms. Um, I'm mainly going to show you the results in manufacturing. Um, you know, the, the typical firm here has about 250 workers. It's, it's a medium size, not a small or large firm. The basic methods we use here can be used in other sectors. So we've done this now in hospitals and schools and retail and a variety of other things. The question needs to be changed to some degree, but a lot of the questions around people are basically very, very similar, no matter which sector you work in. Okay, so what do the scores and the doors look like? So what we do is we take all this data at the firm level and we calculate to begin with the average management score. So this is the kind of measure of management quality across different countries. Um, and you can see that um, you know, the ranking of countries looks similar to what you might have expected from the kind of relative wealth level. So the US uh, gets the highest average management score. You have Japan, Germany, Sweden coming next. Uh, European countries like Britain, um, uh, Ireland is, is down here as well, coming further down. And then southern European countries lower. And then countries at the bottom are kind of African countries and Latin American countries. So if you correlated that with, say, GDP per capita, you see, uh, as, as you'd expect, this is, there's nothing causal here. This is just saying, as you'd expect, the richer countries tend to have higher management than scores in the poorer countries. Um, so, you know, you can see that lines up, lines up reasonably well. Okay. More interesting to me, though, is not just the averages across countries, but looking at within countries. 
So um, what we can do with our data is we can say, well, let's look at every single firm and look at the distribution of management scores by firm. So these people down here on the left, between one and two, are the really badly managed firms. They're not collecting information about anything. Their, their, their targets are uh, really easy to, re easy to reach. They're not uh, promoting people based on merit. They're paying people irrespective of ability. And it's a wonder to an economist how these firms even exist, but we know from experience they do. Um, in most countries, the, the shape is like a bell curve, so most firms are kind of averagely managed. But the thing which strikes you about this, and I, I put an island just as one example, with islands typical of many other countries, there are, you know... There are really bad firms, there are really good firms. There's just amazing variation of the quality of management, just as you would see for, the, for firms' productivity. So it's not like when you compare, say, the United States with India, every American firm is awesome and every Indian firm is terrible. Um, there's good and bad firms in both countries. It just happened in America, for example, one of the features is there's just a lot fewer of these really, really badly managed firms. You can see America in the top left-hand corner there. Okay. Um, so that's fine, there's some data. What about, you know, does this matter in terms of the things we might care about in terms of productivity? So, you know, the first thing you can do is you can say, well, here's a measure of productivity on uh, the, the vertical axis, here's a measure of management on the right axis, these are all our firms. So you see that, you know, the better managed firms tend to have better management scores. So positive relationships, very strong. So that's Good in one sense, it shows our data is correlated with something we care about, which is productivity. You can see the same thing for profits or survival or growth. But of course, you know, is this, is this causal? Maybe there's something else we haven't controlled for. Maybe the better managed, the, the more productive firms can afford to pay, you know, well-paid consultants to come in to help them talk up the management practices. How can we see whether this is really causal? So what we've been doing in recent work is we've been running experiments. So one of these experiments, for example, is in India. So in India, we did an experiment on textile firms outside Mumbai, supported by the World Bank, and we marketed a program whereby um, firms could apply, and if they were successful, they were given free management consultancy by Accenture over a five-month period to turn around the, the management practices. So the randomized treatment plants who applied and were successful got these uh, you know, heavy management consultancy to improve the scores that I've just shown you. The control plants got very, a four-week, very light consultancy, basically just enough to get their data. And then we look you know, over the next few years what happened to their performance. So, you know, one thing which happened is our measured management practices improved. But more importantly, their productivity improved a lot. So the, the, the management index uh, improved by about uh, two standard deviations and productivity inc increased by about 20%. In kind of dollars, this is US dollars, that meant that the treatment plants, the ones who got this intervention, uh, made about $300,000 more per annum than the other plants. And that's, a, you know, compared to if they'd have bought this on the free market, this is about $200,000. So a very, very large increase of profitability and productivity. And just to give you some idea about what that was like, these are, this is like the, after the kind of you know, weight loss diet plan. This is the kind of prior, this is what these kind of places look like prior to the, uh, the intervention. So... <laughs> Very, uh, very disorganized uh, machine tools left lying around, instruments not removed, oil leaking from machines. And then afterwards, we introduced, you know, this is a basic kind of management change program that you'd see in many consultancy interventions, organizing the factories more clearly, tagging things when they went wrong, collecting information to try and improve that, changing the kind of way that people are managed. So if you look at, say, the treatment versus control parts, you can see there's a very big improvement in productivity, which seems to have persisted even when the consultants left after the end of the, uh, the intervention. So these, these, it does seem to be, you know, this is like a clinical trial of management, if you like. You know, it does seem to be that the, the dose had a response, and you know, if you compare this to the, the evidence from the, the uh, 15,000 firms, we get something like a standard deviation increase of management improves productivity by about 10%. So, okay, so that, it matters at the firm level, but doesn't matter at the macroeconomic level. So just to give you some sense of that, we um, looked at the differences of management across countries, taking into account different sizes of firms, and then we said, well, how much of the overall productivity gap can this explain, if any? So here's one example from one country, which is uh, quite badly managed. So you know, compared to the US, Britain has uh, about um, three quarters of a standard deviation worse management than the US, has about 20% less productivity. 
So about 27%, um, so just over a quarter of Britain's gap of productivity in the US is due to worse management. So you know, I showed you that picture of, uh, of Michael Scott from the office. The office came from Britain. That was uh, you know, a successful British export about bad bosses. And you can see that bad bosses have managed to you know, knock over a day a week of uh, productivity off, off the UK. So you know, it differs in different countries, but overall it's about a quarter of, uh, of, the, uh, of the productivity differences are due to management according to our kind of estimates. And you know, Ireland is kind of a, has actually a similar kind of amount of, uh, of uh, lower productivity because of management as, as the UK does. Okay, so that's... So what does this mean for policy? What can we say about policy? Well, one of the things that we can do is actually look at some things which may be drivers of management practice. So here's one. Here's foreign direct investment. So the, the grey line is kind of what I showed you before, except here we just look at domestic firms. And the black, the average management score of domestic firms. The black line is the average management scores of, for, of foreign multinationals. So you can see for foreign multinationals, they have higher management scores than almost every country they go to. Whereas domestic firms, they just mirror what the overall score was. So what this says is that foreign multinationals are somehow able to transplant some of their better practices overseas. And you know, it does give you a sense in which, well, one of the benefits of having foreign direct investment might be bringing better management practices. We were talking about this over lunch, in fact, and you see this very clearly from the, from the data. The second thing is that, so if you look at different ownership types, um, these, again, average management schools, the, some of the... Some of the firms with the lowest management scores are firms which are family-owned and have a family CEO. It's not family ownership per se which is a problem. So if you're family-owned with a professional CEO, a non-family CEO, you have a pretty high management score. The firms with low management scores, the ones which are second-generation firms, where the CEO is the son or the grandson or the great-grandson of the founder. So, you know, this, another way of saying this, one of the surest ways to ruin your business is to give it to your oldest son. You know, <laughs> we got rid of monarchy for a reason, right? Um, so that's, the, I mean, and the, these, I mean, these, I'm showing these correlations. These are robust to controlling for size, for age, for many other factors. So um, a third thing is competition. So I showed you in the U.S., uh, one of the reasons that the U.S. is uh, successful in having better management schools is they don't have some of these very, really badly managed firms. If you look at a simple measure of competition, which is like the, in this case the number of competitors against the management score, the firms which seem to have very high management scores are the ones which are facing more competition. And that's true in, in the manufacturing sector, the retail sector, and even in other, other parts of the economy. So, a and then a fourth thing that we, we've looked at a lot is education. So, you know, unsurprisingly, maybe more educated managers, you tend to get a better management score. This is the proportion of managers who have a college degree. But interestingly, also for non-managers, for the firms which actually have more educated and better trained workers, non-managers, but also the firms where management practices tend to be better. So it suggests that you know, one of the ways to improve things is not just better managerial education, but a, but a general education of, of people in, in the workforce. So just to uh, wrap up, um, so... I've given you a flavour about some of these work, and I've given you a rather unconventional view that in terms of thinking about long-term structural reform policies, things which policies which can aid growth are also those which can improve management. So in terms of policies, one thing is to um, actually allow greater entry and greater exit of inefficient plants. So removing protection for some of the dominant incumbent plants, both small and large plants, can be a way of allowing creative destruction to let the better managed firms grow more easily. Um, competition seems to be particularly important, so deepening the internal market, or especially around services, thinking of the importance of the US-European free trade deal. Um, I think you know, we can talk about Brexit in a minute, but one of the big advances of being in the European Union, I think, for many countries has been actually strengthening competition, which has had this very powerful effect, I'd argue, on productivity and management. So leaving the European Union is an extremely bad idea, or failing to kind of deepen the internal market is a bad idea. Uh, third thing is foreign investment. So I've shown you the importance of FDI. I mean, it was one of the parts of Ireland has been very successful in that. I applaud that. Education and skills are very important. I haven't talked about labour market reform. What, one of the things that you also see, especially in terms of the people management practices, is very heavy labour market restrictions can also um, have, a, have a, a negative effect on manager quality. So thinking about having flexible labour markets is another way of improving management and productivity. So you know, overall, Europe is at a real crossroads at the moment. We, I mean, there have been major successes in integration 
in the European Union over the last 50 years. It's created the largest single market in the world. We've integrated ex-communist countries, countries from you know, former fascist dictatorships in Southern Europe. But going forward, you know, we need to think about these structural reforms to improve our productivity. And I'd really, uh, I'd really, I'd really, I really f want the Euro us as Europeans to think of ways in which we could improve management uh, and reform. Otherwise, we face another era of slow growth. So. Just before I end, um, I just want to mention that one of the great things about doing this kind of research for an economist is you do the radical methodology of talking to human beings, which is something we don't do very much as economists, but uh, actually is, is rather fun. So you, you learn things that you weren't expecting to learn. So um, you might think you know, defining this foreign ownership variable is very easy. In fact, it turns out to have been rather more complicated. So one production manager in Italy said, we are owned by the mafia. And then a rather nervous interviewer said, well, I think that's the other category, although I guess I could put you down as an Italian multinational. <laughs> which, uh, is how this firm is coded in our data, if you ever look at it. Many, well, I ever present this in America. So I, I was in America last year on Sebastian and Harvard, and uh, Americans kind of like this stuff because, you know, America does well in management, does well in uh, productivity. America's not great at everything. So, you know, my daughter was at school in America, and there was some issues here with the schooling. So... Uh, one interviewer asked, how many production sites do you have abroad? And the manager in Indiana, U.S. said, well, we have one in Texas. <laughs> Japan is the right answer. Texas is a, is a different country. Uh, now, these, these are some more uh, uh, politically incorrect ones coming up. <laughs> uh, so here's, well, this is okay. So this is, this is one of the most hilarious ones we had. So this is in Germany, and the interviewer said, hello, hello, are you still there? The production man said, I'm sorry I got distracted by a submarine servicing in front of my window. It turns out this was a kind of defense plant. And this is perhaps the most bizarre, unbelievable one. This is in Japan, where a male manager said to a female manager, I would like you to call me daddy when we talk. And that was end of interview. So end of interview, end of talk. Thank you very much.